Okay, so now we're, you know, into this God deed versus good deed thing. But why is that even the issue? I mean, I've been talking about it on a juridical basis. You know, principles, rules, right and wrong. But the God didn't do everything, how do you want to call this? The reason why God calls a thing right or wrong is because it's good or bad. And is it good or bad for what? It's good or bad for a relationship. I mean, harmony between two people is a wonderful thing. When you can share your life with somebody else and they enjoy it like you do, that's a wonderful thing. Okay? That's the reason to be alive. That's why God did this. That's why God created, to share himself with everything and everybody, however low, however high. He doesn't look at us the way we look at ourselves. He doesn't look at us like, oh, you puny human, you didn't do the right thing. That's the way we examine each other. We're very judgmental. We're very picky and critical because we're very weak. All right? We're always feeling inadequate. We're always feeling inferior. We're always hurting in some way. And so we're always looking for some kind of something or someone to blame. As if that sort of alleviated the pain of what we are. It doesn't ever alleviate the pain. It just makes it worse. It's like picking a pimple. God isn't like that. God didn't make this, you know, creation in order to point the finger at us. Now Satan, of course, is anti-God, so he's always pointing the finger. And we by nature too, Satan became that way, we were born that way, we by nature too are busy pointing the finger. We think and talk and act with all the same mindset that Satan has. That's what that tree in the garden was about. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was Satan's mindset. And when the woman ate from that, it became a genetic thing when she gave it to Adam. That's Romans 5.12 and it was passed on to us. Our whole hard wiring of our souls, after we're born, by means of our volition, the interaction between the body and the soul, we give in to all those body sin nature cravings and attitudes. And our soul literally becomes like Satan's. That's why, you know, when you get saved, you believe in Christ, okay, fine, you're going to heaven forever. But the soul that you got needs to be saved too. It needs to be saved from all this bad thinking. That's a second salvation, which is, which is why you're here on earth after you're saved, for however long a time you're here. Is to get your, your thinking saved. And of course, that's the big point in 1 John and James 2. But, you know, people don't know that because everybody's being childish and sin nature about how they read the Bible. Okay, fine. So we're all down here to get our thinking saved. In order to get your thinking saved, it's the same kind of issue as it was to get saved to heaven. You know, salvation, the way everybody thinks about it, is heaven or hell. Okay, but that's not the only salvation that you need. You need a whole lot of salvations every single day. To get through the day. Alright, but the first salvation, you believe in Christ once, you can go be an axe murderer after that, doesn't matter, you're going to heaven, honey, you can't stop it. Okay, but your thinking sure needs to be saved, and your life still needs to be saved. From all the things that go wrong every single day, whether you do it to yourself, or somebody does it to you. Life is very fragile. Okay, so here we're to learn what that's like. But at God's level, the primary purpose of the God deed versus good deed thing is to pour himself into us so we can have a relationship with him, not to make us better persons. We don't need to be better. Christ paid for that. And we're not better. Okay, but the fact that we're not better, the fact that we're small, the fact that we're, we sin, the fact that our hardwiring sin nature is always pointing the finger, is no impediment 
to God pouring himself into us. It just alters the way he chooses to do it. Before there was creation, he knew all this stuff. He's the one who created the idea of what truth would even be. He is truth, so he creates truth. What truth did he create? He created truth be free. Okay, and he foreknew what that was going to be. Because he created it. And so every single speck of dust, every sin, everything that goes wrong, he is baptized with a meaning by pouring himself into it and saying, Hi, this speck of dust is going to be in this spot on a freeway at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I want that speck of dust that's sitting on the freeway to have this meaning. And so it does. So how much more for each one of us? Because the, the meaning he wants for us is to have a relationship with him. If we say no, we say no, but he still designed it to have that meaning. And if we say no, he's also incorporated into the design, the effects of the no, and he agrees to the no by his own choice, his own sovereign choice. It's something the Calvinists will never understand. God agrees to go against himself. This is Satan's big argument in the trial. You're going against yourself, God. Okay, fine, you're God, you can do that, you're big enough. And if you want to be a masochist, that's your problem. But why are you imposing your desires and your design on us? We have the burden of living with you. It's not merely you having the burden of living with us. And God's answer to that is, Hi, I want to show you how it doesn't matter that I'm high and you're low. I'm going to fill you with me. That's Ephesians 4, 1, 15 through 23, um, Isaiah 54, 1, and a verse I forgot about but mentioned in other audio, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. Now, i got to focus on that verse because this illustrates the whole thing about the relationship. When I first talked about that verse in one of the audios last week or week before, I made a big stink about how God says, my power is brought to completion in weakness. I said the verb there ought to be translated brought to completion, not made perfect. My pastor translated that same verse as made operational in weakness. Okay, that's uh, verse 9, Second Corinthians 12, 9. Now, I have seen that verse in the Greek maybe twice in the last 30 years, maybe three times. And most of the time that I've heard about it, I heard about it in audio tape from my pastor. And I just remembered the Greek words. Okay, but he didn't talk about the Greek word for operational. He didn't mention that. And I wasn't looking up the verse when I was talking on the audio. It's real important to say that because when I was talking to you on the audio saying he brought it to completion that the word should be translated completion. The same time I was talking about that and saying that I'm thinking wait a minute my pastor translated as operational that's Greek verb energizo. Why am I sitting here saying in this audio that it's brought to completion? And I was certain I was telling you the right thing. So today, I look it up. I haven't seen the Greek in years. And what I told you is right. So the Holy Spirit knew it was right. The Greek verb there is teleo. And that's actually the word I was thinking of when I made the audio a couple weeks ago. But I didn't look it up because the computer was off and I was lying down with my stupid sprained arm. So see, there is an example of how he fills you. He filled me with the correct knowledge about the verse while I'm talking in the audio. When I myself, while talking, had doubts that what I was telling you was true. And yet I was certain it was true. So I went with what I was certain. Yeah, and what I told you was true. Because the Holy Spirit knew what that verse really said. It is the Greek verb teleo, oh, it means to perfect as in a contract. See, in English, the word to perfect is a verb. It has a legal connotation of to complete a contract. Your side in a contract. You write a contract between you and somebody else. You complete the contract 
by fulfilling whatever the terms are that you, you know, committed yourself to. That's Greek for teleo, and it's usually translated in English Bibles as to perfect, which is a fine translation as long as you know the legal meaning of to perfect the contract. You'll see that in Hebrews 2, you'll see that in Hebrews 4. The writer of Hebrews uses teleo and pleiro, you know, together. And my pastor did make a big thing about that. Pleiro means to fill up. Okay, teleo means to fulfill, as in terms of a contract. It's a legal term. So it means perfect, all right. But it's perfect as in a contract. So here is your example of the relationship. Because I've been learning and living on Bible for so long, I got a lot of Bible information in my head. So when I'm talking to you in the audio, even when I'm unsure the Holy Spirit can get through to me, justifiably it's not like he's unable it's just you know he goes by what's justifiable to tell me and he got it out to you rightly that doesn't mean everything I say is right I'm talking about a specific instance you always have to test everything everybody else says because it's always this bi-directional mix of what God's causing the person to do right and what the person is doing of his own power and you never know the difference until you test it so everything I ever say to you, I always have to go back and retest. Because I always screw up something. You get this point? This is the relationship. This is how it works. God is always talking to you. God is always giving you information. God is always interpreting for you everything in your life. Whether it's how to do an email, how to do the dishes. Nothing's too small for him. You know, we get, as humans, just like we're always pointing the finger, we have this idea that, well, God's big, he shouldn't be, he's not going to be involved in my little life. And so we don't pray the way we should. You better pray about everything. Pray to God about what do, what do you eat for dinner. Okay, I mean, if you want to have a really um, fulfilling life with God, that's what you ought to do. I mean, I don't do it enough either. But it's, it's the best goal of life. It's like, okay, Dad, what do I eat for dinner? What should I be thinking now? He's got a will on everything in your life. And nothing's too small a question for him. You're not wasting God's time to pray, to ask. The problem is we don't ask enough, and I'm just as guilty as everybody else. The relationship is supposed to be bidirectional, total, 24-7. That's what being Christ-like means. Christ was always online with God. You're supposed to always be in God's chat room. He's talking to you. You're talking back. There's all kinds of issues. And, you know, it's just like any other relationship. And it's the most intimate of all relationships. Every single thought brought into captivity, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, just flew into my mind. Well, if it's every thought into captivity, then you have to be online with God 24-7. That's why you need 1 John 1, 9. I use it, you know, hi, Dad, I think I just sinned. I'm not sure. It's, you know, confess, you know, naming that, that I might have sinned is, is enough if I'm not sure. Admitting sin is the point. Then back online. And sometimes I know specifically what it is, Dad, I sinned, and I got a specific sin in mind. Okay, and then all the ones I forgot about are also cleared off. That's what 1 John 1 9 does, puts you back online with God. It's all about the relationship. It's really not about right and wrong. Right and wrong is a way to express a relationship. When you marry somebody, or you have kids, or you interact with somebody, you're constantly using principles of right and wrong. And you're using it with respect to yourself, too. What should I do now? What should I not do now? Oh, this is right. Oh, I didn't do the dishes. Oh, I got to pick up Johnny's clothes. Those are all right and wrong questions. Okay, that's how you express your relationship to those things or to those people. Rightly or wrongly. <laughs> See, it's the relationship first and we're all forgetting that. Me too. This good deed versus God deed thing is about the relationship. If you're talking about good deeds, then you are not talking about a relationship with God. 
You're talking about a relationship of yourself to whatever good deeds you do. You're cutting out God. It's the worst evil there is to do a good deed. Worst. That's what Satan's whole argument is about. Satan can do something good. God should reward him. That's it. Cain's same argument in Genesis 4. Cain slaved to make vegetables. God should reward him for that. After all, God's the one who made it so hard to do the vegetables. You see that? Those are arguments based on hatred. Those are arguments based on not wanting a, an intimate relationship with God, but rather wanting goodies from God. Somebody who wants goodies from you does not love you. Somebody who wants goodies from you is using you. When you go to God and you say, God, you should reward me for this, you're using God. You don't love him. You hate him. So the relationship, when anybody's arguing about good deeds, I don't care how pious they are or how misguided they are in thinking that it's the right thing to say, anybody emphasizing good deeds is emphasizing hatred of God, cutting God out of the picture, and instead putting self in God's place and what self does, what self can do. But God says, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, my power is made perfect through weakness. The Greek, for, Greek word there is asthenia. And it means the kind of helplessness where you just can't do anything. It means helplessness, really. Weakness is too small a word in English. Asthenes means just like you're flat on your back, can't do anything. It, it has a moral connotation with it. It means that you're useless. That you're useless because you're, you're you know, you're, you're not only unable, you're like not willing. Somebody that you pull out of the ranks of an army. Somebody who's useless to the army. Just pull them out and shoot them. Okay? We're weakness. God's power is made operational, but it's not really operational. It's teleo o perfect. Perfected. Completed in weakness, in helplessness. So God deeds are what God does. If you're voting for God deeds, then it's not your power, it's His power. And what are you really voting for? You're voting for the relationship. You want God to do it. You don't care if it hurts. You don't care if it feels good. I'm, I'm serious about this. This is not you sacrificing anything. It's not a sacrifice. It comes off that way. It feels that way. But it's not what it is. You have a choice. Do you want God to do it or do you want to do it? That's the whole trial right there. If you want God to do it, then you're electing the relationship with God. If you want to do it, you're electing a relationship with yourself. And you're cutting God out of the picture. Now, when we choose to do things ourselves, we have, in our minds, motives of doing for. You know, and I, I screw this up all the time, just like everybody else. Oh, but God, I want to do something for you. I want to give you something. It's not fair that you have to do all the work. I think that way all the time. Just like Satan does. Because Satan's in love with God, too. Satan is absolutely in love with God, and he absolutely hates him all at the same time. You see that when you read the Greek of Matthew 4. He's so apoplectic there. He's constantly going back and forth in his mind. The poor guy is really insane. He's just, he's just livid. Because he feels helpless. He wants to do for God, and God won't credit him. And so to deal with that discomfort, he's come up with this idea that something's got to be wrong with God. So now he hates him too. And we've all been there. We, we've had that kind of relationship with people. So we, kind of, we can relate. I want to do for you, God. It's not fair that you have to do all the doing. Okay, but the fact is that if God doesn't do the doing, it's not good enough. Whatever I can do for him is not going to do anything for him. And he doesn't want me to do Petrix for him. 
He wants to do them for me. Okay, so once you accept that much, it's like, okay, God, how, how do I think now? I'm going to eat dinner. What's a God deed for eating dinner? Can you turn that into a God deed? Yeah, you can. What do I eat for dinner, God? Now that looks like an obedience question. God orders you to eat steak or fish or vegetables or whatever it is. But that's not what it is. It's communication. God is going to pick something. You say, okay, God, what am I going to eat for dinner? You know, that's not a juridical issue. It's a relationship issue. When you're with your family, what do we eat for dinner tonight, Mom? What's for dinner tonight, Mom? Well, what do you want, children? You see? It's a way to express fellowship, not necessarily a good deed, bad deed, morally immoral question. God's not going to tell you, eat um, nails for breakfast. But he might come up with something like, well, go get an Egg McMuffin. What just happened if you went to get the Egg McMuffin? Let's say God told you, and you could be sure that it came from God, not your imagination. Go get an Egg McMuffin for breakfast. Okay, what communication is that? Why did God pick Egg McMuffin? See, you can play with that. And if God really told you to go get an Egg McMuffin for breakfast, He's going to have a reason why He picked it. And then you learn His thinking. You see? So it's not about eating. See how eating breakfast, and even an Egg McMuffin at that, which most people will tell you, you know, you shouldn't eat, it's not good for you, blah, blah, blah. All right. If God really picked an Egg McMuffin, you can learn his thinking behind that. So it's not about eating breakfast anymore. It's about learning God's thinking. And what is God's thinking? Delight yourself in fatness. That's in Isaiah 55. God is not into making you live the sacrificial life. Uh-uh. It's full spectrum. Some things are sacrificial. Other things are just such, so much abundance that it's, it's over the top. Everything God's over the top. Okay, so if you're constantly asking him questions, what do I do here? What do I think there? That looks like an obedience question, and that is bringing every thought into captivity. But at the better level, the deeper level, it's about the relationship, the bi-directional communication between God and you. And you'll hit your mind with certain thoughts and answers that will occur to your mind. It's not a physical voice, as you well know. And if it really came from God, you can test it and prove why it fits Bible. And then you're learning a whole bunch more about the Bible and about God through the very act of saying, okay, what do I eat for breakfast? So then the breakfast is ennobled. You got that? You're no longer just eating breakfast or sitting on the toilet or writing an email. It's an occasion for expressing the relationship with God and learning more about Bible, learning more about His Word, learning more about Him. Now, here comes the punchline. That makes it perfect. That completes the contract. That is 2 Corinthians 12, 9, operating in your life. You see why? What's the weakness? Oh, I got to eat breakfast. Oh, I got to decide what to eat for breakfast. Oh, I got to spend all this time rummaging through my refrigerator or going to McDonald's on the way to work. What do I do? Now that can be a real chore and a real annoyance. Or that weakness can be an occasion for more bi-directional communication between God and you where you actually learn more Bible and you see Him better. So what just happened? God perfected the weakness into a high relationship with Him. 
The McMuffin exists in order to provide an occasion for perfecting the relationship with God upon that Egg McMuffin. So shouldn't the Egg McMuffin exist? It's a, it's a potential for learning something more about God because he can baptize it with a communication if somebody asks him, should I eat this Egg McMuffin? Now, apply that to everything else in your life, and you'll realize, hey, wait a minute. i got to be online with God 24-7 asking Him questions. And at first, that's going to sound like a lot of effort. But after you get used to it, it means that every single thing in your life is no longer boring, no longer annoying, no longer stupid. I mean, the thing remains what it is. An Egg McMuffin remains an Egg McMuffin. It doesn't magically transform. But what gets done with it is now suddenly enjoyable, divine, and changes your soul so that you see God better. So if you can see God better by eating an Egg McMuffin, wouldn't you do that? See the point? Why wouldn't God allow sin or bad to happen if he can use it to make a more intimate relationship with you see that that's why I did it it's not simply the juridical question of truth be free although that of itself would be enough reason it's because he can create an intimacy out of it the cross is the ultimate intimacy of the Godhead God to God. Christ is giving to Father. Father is giving to Son. Spirit is giving to both of them. And they're giving to the Spirit. All at once on the cross. It's a three-way gifting. Because what does God give to God except Himself? What can you give to God except yourself? And I mean, you can say, well, yeah, but the value of me really just isn't worth it. Well, but God can make it worth it. You want to give yourself to him. Okay. You're worthless. Okay, fine. God perfects the contract in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. You want to give God something. You want to do for God. Okay, let God do it to you. And that will do for God. Versus what Satan says. Well, I just want to do it for you. You know, I'm going to do this good and you have to reward me. Satan doesn't want the relationship. He just wants the goodies. But you want the relationship. And you feel bad because you can't give anything to God. Okay. God can give something to you that will give to him. And, you know, it's not like you don't go through anything. You have to go through the experience of being remade. And it doesn't feel good. And you still want it. And then sometimes it feels too good. And you feel that's unfair too. But you still want it. So today he says go eat an Egg McMuffin. Which you know. Golly should I do that? It's got all these calories. It costs more money. It tastes good. Why should I get that thing that tastes good? And then tomorrow he might have you eat. You know. Bran flakes. I mean, I happen to like Blend Brand Flakes, but pretend they didn't. You see? Full spectrum. It's not about suffering. It's not about having things be nice and feeling guilty if they're too nice. It's about experience in life with God, just like it is with anybody else. You go through good stuff and bad stuff with people you love. And you want to. Because you love them. When you really love somebody, you want to be in everything in their life. You want to just be with them 24-7. You want to be with everything in their life, good, bad, or indifferent. You want to be with them when they're, you know, bad. And you want to be with them when they're good. You just want to be with them. You know, a lot of people, you know, women make hook up with bad guys and they still love them. 
guys hook up with bad women and they still love them. God hooks up with us and he still loves us. And then we have a, a real hard time with that. So how do you resolve that? Have it be a God deed. Just that, okay God, what do I eat for breakfast? Not because you're trying to get it right, although you are, and that's part of the you know, behavioral aspect of it. But really because that way you learn more stuff about him, no matter what the answer is. And the answer isn't eat bran flakes. That's what the Calvinists and the Catholics and everybody would have you believe. Oh, it's a hard life, brother. You must sacrifice. No, that's not it at all. It's full spectrum, like Paul said. I know how to be abased, and I know how to be abound. Like Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 10. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Full spectrum, baby. So that's why you want God deeds. Because that way, God ennobles and makes good on even breakfast, or pee, or a sprained arm, or inheriting a million dollars. Everything in life has a problem associated with it. The thing that's good about a thing is also the very same thing as bad about it. The thing that's good about money is also the very thing that's wrong with it. The thing that's good about a lack of money is also the very thing that's wrong with it. You know, money buys time and money robs you of time. Having no money robs you of time and also buys time. That's the irony of everything. It's all joined. The advantage and the disadvantage are joined together by divine design. High, low, God makes perfect in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. And if you're voting for that, you're voting for the relationship. You're voting for God to fix it. You're voting for God to do the doing. Because, hey, honey, you're weak. So am I. We can't do anything. So the question is, are we going to try and do it on our own power, like Satan's doing, and then turn around to God and, and, and expect him to credit us for that? Are we going to let God do the doing, and then because God did the doing, it's actually good for a change, and then he rewards us for what he did? Second, 1 Corinthians 3, your choice.